afternoon and Salam Malaysia Madani. You're watching Updates at Noon with me, Renee Fong. On our top stories today, one-third parliamentary seat composition for Sabah Sarawak still on discussion. MOH to devise measures to resolve issues on country's health care system. Returning the one-third seat composition in the Dewan Rakyat for Sabah and Sarawak as stipulated in the Malaysia Agreement 1963, MA63, is still in the discussion stage. However, Deputy Prime Minister Datuk Sri Fadila Yusuf said the matter will take two to three years to be completed. Explaining further, he said the matter needed to go through many stages, including three main committees, namely the MA63 Steering Committee, MA63 Technical Committee and MA63 Implementation Action Council, as well as various parties. Datuk Sri Fadila said the MA63 Technical Committee chaired by him would discuss issues related to MA63 based on topic and give priority to those that did not involve complicated legal or technical matters proses tu masih panjang sebab kita kena dapat persetujuan kabinet lepas persetujuan kabinet kena bawa ke parlimen dan parlimen ni pula memerlukan 2/3 bersetuju kalau tak disetujui maka tak lulus mungkin mengambil masa 2 ke 3 tahun sebabnya banyak proses dia akan melibatkan engagement di peringkat uh, public lagi untuk dapat pandangan umum dan sebagainya. The Deputy Premier said this after appearing as a guest on RTM's Narrative Khas bersama Timbalan Perdana Menteri program last night. Earlier in the program, Datuk Sri Fadila said that the one-third parliamentary seat allocation for Sabah and Sarawak was important as it would not allow the peninsula to amend the constitution that may eliminate the rights of the two states as enshrined in MA63. In addition to the parliamentary seat allocation, he said the return of autonomy of education and health to Sabah and Sarawak was also currently in the discussion stage. On the Sarawak's first slogan, Datuk Sri Fadila said it was created to restore the spirit of the people of Sarawak to together build and develop Malaysia. He said although there were calls for Sarawak to leave Malaysia, the Gabungan Parti Sarawak GPS leadership has expressed its commitment that the state will remain as part of Malaysia. In other development, Datuk Sri Fadila, who is also the Plantations and Commodities Minister, said his ministry will discuss with industry players to improve the ecosystem, thus attracting more local workers to be involved in the plantation industry. He said this is among the government's effort to reduce dependency on foreign labour. Satu inisiatif untuk kita pastikan kebergantungan kepada pekerja asing itu dapat dikurangkan yeah. dengan kita melatih pekerja-pekerja tempatan hmm. bila mechanisation ini mungkin mereka akan berminat sebab mereka uh, akan menggunakan teknik-teknik yang moden untuk uh, memetik buah, memunggah buah dan segala proses itu. Hmm. Dan pada masa sama kita kena galakkan industri players menyediakan yeah. kemudahan dari segi tempat diamnya, apa, apa saja yang diperlukan supaya keadaan lebih baik untuk menarik pekerja-pekerja tempatan. Meanwhile, Datuk Sri Fadila said the Ministry of Plantation and Commodities will look at research and development R&D and marketing Malaysia's products internationally in the retabling of budget 2023 on 24th February. He said the country heavily depends on imports from foreign countries currently, but it is necessary to ensure that Malaysia's product acceptance can be maintained on the global stage. Dapat 
The Ministry of Health, MOH, is in the process of devising measures to resolve emerging issues regarding the country's health care system. Health Minister Dr Zaliha Mustafa, in a thread on her Twitter page, said a targeted approach is being planned involving issues such as the welfare, physical and mental health of health workers, determination of a fair salary and job security. She said MOH will also hold a meeting with the Ministry of Finance to present details about the need to obtain larger allocations covering aspects of infrastructure, digitalization of systems and human resources. She added that regular meetings with all stakeholders would also continue to be held to get feedback, especially from staff in the field. This, she said, included identifying short-term and long-term solutions that needed to be prioritized and that much of the healthcare reform process demanded a cross-agency approach. Dr Zaliha also expressed her commitment to working hand-in-hand -hand with the Ministry and other agencies for the good and benefit of health sector workers and civil society as a whole. She added that all the things mentioned are also part of the new improvements and priorities in the health white paper, which will be used as a benchmark for various health sector reforms in the future. Flood evacuees in Johor and Sabah rise to 1,735. The number of malicious and false statements spread by SMS or social media platforms have become too widespread. The public is advised to be careful and not fall for such ploys and sharing or forwarding such messages. Remember that spreading fake news is an offence under Section 233 of the Communications and Multimedia Act 1998. This carries the penalty of a fine not exceeding 50,000 ringgit or up to one year imprisonment or both upon conviction. Welcome back. A total of 1,735 flood victims are still housed at relief centres in Sabah and Johor this morning, an increase from 1,666 people last night. In Sabah, the number of evacuees rose to 758 people from 220 families compared to 690 people from 204 families last night. And they are currently taking shelter at 15 centres in five districts. The State Disaster Management Committee, JPBN Secretariat, in a statement said the Lupit has the highest number of victims with 425 people from 120 families moved to eight centres. The statement read that some 123 people from 46 families were relocated to three relief centres in Paitan, 118 people from 33 families to one centre in Beaufort, 47 people from nine families to two centres in Baluran and 45 people from 12 families to one centre in Lahat Datu. The number of evacuees in Paitan and Baluran is expected to increase and remain unchanged in other districts. And in Johor, the number of flood victims in three districts rose slightly from 976 people last night to 977 people as of 8 a.m. today. The JPBN Secretariat said 10 relief centres are still operating in Batu Pahat, Kota Tinggi and Segamat to house 273 families. Batu Pahat still recorded the highest number of evacuees with 873 people, followed by Segamat 63 and Kota Tinggi 41. An RTM survey found that the people wishes for the Menu Rahma initiative to be continued in the long run after considering its benefits to the B40 community. As such, more restaurants operators are welcomed to join making the initiative a success. 
Ha, saya rasa ini bagus. Ini adalah satu uh, usaha kerajaan yang patut kita hargai dan kita banggakanlah sebagai membantu apa, rakyat kita yang agak susah sekarang. So, uh, ini agak apa, efek ekonomikal untuk uh, customer kita. Lah. Ha, untuk saya, saya rasa kita kena support lah sebab pada masa sekarang ni kan dengan ekonomi yang tak menentu jadi program macam ni yang dapat mengurangkan beban bagi saya benda ni patut digalakkan sebab dia boleh membantu banyak lagi golongan yang apa ni yang tak berkemampuan lah ataupun orang-orang yang macam maksudnya um, lagi memerlukan macam ni sebab dia satu set balas sangat ada air ada nasi ada lauk dengan sayur sekali The Immigration Department has activated its newly created Quick Response Team QRT as a proactive measure to overcome congestion at the country's entry points. This particularly at the Kuala Lumpur International Airport, KLIA and KLIA 2, as well as the Johor Causeway. Immigration Director General Datuk Sri Khairul Zaimi Daud said the move was taken following Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim's directive last Monday, asking the department and the Royal Malaysian Customs Department to increase the number of officers on duty at the Sultan Iskandar Building (BSI) and the Sultan Abu Bakar Complex (KSAB) to ease congestion at the Johor Causeway. Dan mereka ini datangnya daripada pegawai-pegawai yang bertugas di bahagian penguat kuasa ataupun enforcement dan juga daripada pegawai-pegawai yang membuat tugas-tugas am di pejabat immigration KLA. Mereka ini telah pun diberikan latihan yang secukupnya dan diberi ID untuk membolehkan mereka akses kepada sistem dan pada hari ini seramai 12 orang pegawai daripada QRT telah bertugas dan mereka dapat memenuhi kaunter-kaunter yang uh, kosong. According to the department's records, a total of 495,210 foreign visitors or 665 people per hour entered the country through KLIA last month. He said with QRT, the immigration department can handle a faster entry rate of 780 foreign visitors per hour or 13 entries in one minute compared to 495 entries in 47 minutes previously. The Immigration Department detained 67 illegal immigrants during an operation at an illegal settlement in Nilai Spring near Seremban at 1.30 a.m. on Wednesday. State Immigration Director Kenneth Tan Ai Kiang said they had detained Indonesian nationals aged between two months and 72. He said their surveillance found that there was a school at the settlement teaching children the syllabus of a neighbouring country, adding that it was powered by electricity source from several generator units. The personnel involved in the operation had to walk about 1.2 kilometres through a jungle area to get to the settlement that is situated on uneven swampy land scattered with traps and dogs roaming the area. He said initial surveillance found that the illegal immigrants built the settlement over two years ago, adding that a Upon inspection, they also found weapons such as spears and machetes. They are being detained under the Immigration Act 1959-63, the Passport Act 1966 and the Immigration Regulations 1963. front North Korea threatened to make Korean Peninsula into war zone. Stay with us. The United States and South Korea carried out a joint air drill on Wednesday uh, with American B-1B heavy bombers and F-22 stealth fighters, as well as F-35 jets from both countries. According to South Korea's Defense Ministry, the combined air drills this time show the United States' will and capabilities to provide strong and credible extended deterrence against North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. On Tuesday, Austin and his South Korean counterpart vowed to expand military drills and deploy more strategic assets, such as aircraft carriers and long-range bombers, to counter North Korea's weapons development and prevent a war. 
South Korean President Yoon suk yeol who took office in May, brought back joint military exercises with his country's U.S. ally. The drills had been scaled down or halted under former President Donald Trump, who was hoping the move would facilitate his nuclear negotiations with the North Korean leader. Currently, more than 28,500 American troops are based in South Korea as a legacy of the 1915-1953 Korean War, which ended in an armistice rather than a peace treaty. Meanwhile, North Korea's foreign ministry today said that drills by the United States and its allies have pushed the situation to an extreme red line and threatened to turn the peninsula into a huge war arsenal and a more critical war zone. The statement, which was carried out by state news agency KCNA, said Pyongyang was not interested in dialogue as long as Washington pursues hostile policies. A spokesperson in a statement said the military and political situation on the Korean peninsula and in the region has reached an extreme red line due to the reckless military confrontational maneuvers and hostile acts of the U.S. and its base of forces. It added that North Korea will respond to any military moves by the United States and has strong counteraction strategies including the most overwhelming nuclear force if necessary. Last year, North Korea conducted a record number of ballistic missile tests, which are banned by United Nations Security Council resolutions. It was also observed reopening its shuttered nuclear weapons test site, raising expectations of a nuclear test for the first time since 2017. A Russian rocket destroyed an apartment building in the eastern Ukrainian city of Karamatorsk late on Wednesday, and at least two people were killed with seven others wounded. Social media videos posted on Ukrainian President Zelensky's Telegram account show a damaged building and emergency services on the site. Regional Governor Pavlo Kirilenko said the Russian occupiers hit a residential building in the center of the city with a rocket and completely destroyed it. He said at least two people were dead, warning that more victims might be found by rescuers, law enforcement officers and others at the scene. At least 44 people were killed last month when a Russian missile hit an apartment building in the eastern city of Dnipro. Last April, Ukraine said 57 people died when a Russian missile hit the train station in Karamatorsk. Moscow denied responsibility, saying the missile was Ukrainian. Kramatorsk is in Dantes, where Kremlin-backed separatists have controlled parts of the eastern industrial region, including its largest city since 2014. Moscow now seeks to capture the entire region after declaring it part of Russia last year. The Brazilian military launched an operation to crack down on illegal gold miners accused of invading the massive Yanomami indigenous reservation and spreading disease, violating human rights and destroying the environment. The Air Force said it was deploying fighter jets and surveillance planes to wrest back control of the airspace over the remote territory and halt movement of small aircraft that resupply the outlaw mining camps. Indigenous leaders say some 20,000 miners have set up illegal operations, raping and killing inhabitants, poisoning their water with mercury and ravaging the forest. Police opened an investigation last week into crimes, including genocide, on the reservation. President Luis Inacio Lula da Silva issued an order on Monday closing the airspace over parts of the region and authorizing the military to divert planes suspected of resupply illegal camps. The government has reported around 100 Yanomami children died of malnutrition and other diseases last year. Defense Minister Jose Musio said he would visit the territory Wednesday next week with the commanders of the Army, Air Force, Navy and Federal Police. 
The Air Force says it has already flown 61 tons of food and medical supplies into the territory and set up a field hospital to treat indigenous patients in Boa Vista. The head of the field hospital, Juliana Freire Vandersteen, told a news conference medical personnel had treated 300 people so far, mostly children, and most of them suffered from pneumonia, intestinal parasites, malaria, and skin diseases. The Yanomami territory, the largest reservation in Brazil, sits on the country's northern border with Venezuela and home to around 30,000 indigenous inhabitants. Peru's Congress rejected a proposal to move elections forward to December 2023, despite nearly two months of protests that have left dozens dead following the ousting of former President Pedro Castillo. Lawmakers will continue debating a different proposal to hold early elections, a key demand of the protesters. But Peru's Congress is deeply fragmented and reaching an agreement is tricky. The first proposal, which came from the right-wing Popular Force Party, was rejected by 68 lawmakers and voted in favour of by 54 with two abstentions. Now, Castillo's party, Peru Libre, will try to wrangle votes for their proposal, which includes a non-binding referendum for a new constitution and new members of Congress. A supermajority of 87 votes is needed to advance the proposal, while 66 votes are needed to trigger a national referendum. On the streets, protesters blocked roads using tractors and roads in the Huancayo and Yali areas and reiterated their demand for President Dina Bularte to step down. Peru has been embroiled in a political crisis with near-daily demonstrations since 7 December, when then-President Pedro Castillo was arrested after attempting to dissolve Congress and rule by decree. In seven weeks of demonstrations, 48 people, including one police officer, have been killed in clashes between security forces and protesters. Manchester United set up League Cup final with Newcastle. Stay tuned. Sheikh Salman bin Ibrahim Al Khalifa officially retained his role as the Asian Football Confederation's president for a final four-year term yesterday as Saudi Arabia was confirmed as the host of the 2027 Asian Cup. The Bahraini, who took over at the head of the Asian Confederation in 2013 when he was elected to complete the remaining two years of deposed former President Mohammed bin Hammam's reign, stood and opposed and was elected by acclamation. His new four-year term will be his last due to limits imposed under the governing body statutes and the 57-year-old will have been in charge of Asian football for 14 years by the time his stint ends in 2027. Sheikh Salman took over for the last two years of Bin Hammam's stint as AFC president after the Qatari was banned for life by governing body FIFA from all football activities for his involvement in a corruption scandal. Saudi Arabia, meanwhile, was confirmed as the host of the 2027 edition of the Asian Cup as the Congress ratified their selection after India, Iran, Qatar and Uzbekistan had earlier withdrawn from the bidding process. Saudi Arabia's Yasser al-Mishal was elected to the FIFA Council alongside Japan's Kozo Tashima, Sheikh Hamad Khalifa Al Thani from Qatar, Mariano Araneta of the Philippines, and Malaysia's Dato Haji Hamidin Muhammad Amin. Laos Kenya Kemoni was elected to take the FIFA Council seat reserved for female representation. Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim congratulates the President of the Football Association of Malaysia, FAM, Dato Hamidin Muhammad Amin, on being elected as one of the five Asian Football Confederation AFC representatives to the FIFA Council, male, for the 2023 to 2027 term. 
Datuk Hamidin, who was previously a member of the AFC Executive Committee, was elected at the 33rd AFC Congress held at the Gulf Convention Centre in Bahrain yesterday. He was elected after garnering 30 votes in the seven-cornered challenge. Datuk Hamidin said winning the FIFA Council post was not a personal achievement but rather a victory for the nation and development of football in the country. The FIFA Council post is also a victory for the development of futsal, women's football, beach football and all activities related to football in the country and world. Meanwhile, Dato Hamidin thanked Dato Sri Anwar for his support and encouragement during his meeting with the latter. For the record, other Malaysians who had served in FIFA include the Yang Dipertuan Agong Al Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al Mustafa Bila Shah had served the FIFA Council from 2015 to 2019, while the late Tan Sri Hamza Abu Sama held the FIFA Vice President's post for eight years from 1982 until 1990. Manchester United will meet Newcastle at Wembley on 26 February in the League Cup final after a 2-0 win over Nottingham Forest sealed a 5-0 semi-final aggregate victory. Anthony Marshall and Fred scored the goals for Eric Ten Hag's men in the final 17 minutes as United booked their place in the first League Cup final for six years. Given the one-sided nature of the first leg, there was little attacking intensity in the earlier part of the first half in the second. It took until the closing stages of the first half for either goalkeeper to be properly called into action. However, neither side conceded to a goal. Into the second half, Ten Hag brought in Marcus Rashford, Jaden Sancho and Anthony Marshall just past the hour mark to increase the home side's attacking threat. It did not take long for the deadlock to be broken. In the 73rd minute, Rashford saw a shot blocked and Marshall was on hand to slam home the rebound. Just three minutes later, Rashford had a second assist. After a fine cross from the outside of his right foot from Bruno Fernandes, Rashford helped the ball back across the face of goal, allowing Fred to nudge it home from barely a yard out. Hussein Al Shahat, Mohammad Asharif, and Percy Tao all scored as Egyptian side Al Ahli cruised to a 3 0 victory over Auckland City at the Club World Cup in Morocco to set up a second round tie against Seattle Sounders. Ahli, who have won the bronze medal in the previous two editions, dominated the contest at the IBN Batuta Stadium in Tangier and now look forward to a far more testing outing against Major League Soccer opposition at the same venue on Saturday. The Cairo club had to wait until... And that's it from us this afternoon. Our top story, returning the one-third seat composition in the Dewan Rakyat for Sabah and Sarawak, still in the discussion stage. And don't forget to join us again tonight at 10pm for more news on Saluran Brita RTM. Or you can catch it online on RTM Click's website and mobile app. In case you miss it, you can also stream it on Brita RTM's YouTube channel. I'm Renee Fong, thank you for watching and have a pleasant and wonderful day ahead.